So a few weeks ago, I had my head in my hands and I was thinking, what on earth are we going to do? How are we going to manage to run events online? And I, I don't know the answer, but we're getting there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I could switch my camera on for a moment and then you can see. So it's my name's Alan O'Donoghue. Uh, I, I can see lots of names there I recognize. Oh, let me move my browser over here and then it looks like I'm actually looking at the camera. Um, let me turn the light on. Hey, I don't know if that makes any difference or not. So there's a couple of, there's a lots and lots of friends. It's so good to see you all here this evening. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of our Preston community at the moment. So we've got Martin Bateman. I don't know if Martin Bateman's going to speak. He's literally just jumped in a moment ago. And we have Josh. Now, the reason I mentioned those two people's names is we've created a team of moderators. So this evening your moderators are me josh and martin and we'll be trying to make sure that everything runs smoothly a part of my job i agreed that i would do this at the beginning uh, gary could you please mute your microphone or we'll come and do that for you okay so i'm going to do a little bit of orientation and my plan is that we're going to start with our first talk at 10 past six and just just so it's a bit of a heads up, the, the person who was at 10 past six that we're hoping is Simon Monk. And then we're going to see if Jay is ready to talk after Simon and then Mark Weddell. But you never know. Things might not work the way we'd planned. So I just want to do a little bit of an orientation, take you round the space. Now, if you're looking at a screen the way that I am, I want you to just cast your eye to the left hand side. Oh, okay, if I point to my right. Okay, but to look to the left-hand side of the screen. And if you look, you should see somewhere in the middle, you'll probably see your name appear with a little box next to it. And all I'm going to ask you, first of all, is to find your name and then just click on it. And if you click on your own name, you can set your status. And I'd love to see a nice, big, happy smile. So I don't want confused faces or thumbs down. You're just going to go now, oh, Alison's smiling, Andrea's smiling, and Muscan, and okay, so you now know that you can change your status. So um, you don't have to keep doing that, but you probably saw that there's some other things in there, like you can put your hand up, you can put your thumbs up, but you've now discovered as well that where the, um, the messages bar is. And if you look up and down, if you scroll up and down, you'll see there's probably about 20 Oh, lovely to see some other names there I recognize now. Um, so um, the thing I'm going to mention now is up in the top left, just above that, it says public chat. It's like two speech bubbles. And I just noticed there's 18 messages since I last looked there. Lots of people saying hello. Good to see you all. I'm waving at you. OK. Now, um, oh, it looks like somebody has started recording the event. OK, that's fine. OK, so we're three minutes into the recording. now. Uh, you need to now know that things that appear in the chat are recorded. So if you're going to put your mobile number, your email in there, that might not be such a good idea in the public chat. What I would love you to do in the public chat, type in anything that you think is safe for a public chat, like uh, things that you are interested in, if you think of links and stuff in, in terms of what we hear. Um, but there's also, if you've got a question, so we're going to have three people coming up to present in a moment. And the plan is we'll have Simon Monk and Jay and then Mark Weddell. And we're asking you not to interrupt their flow. Let them do their talk. They're going to have about five minutes each in which to present. And then we're going to have a short break after them. And if you type in a question in the public chat, like with the word question, you could do it in capital letters. You could just do a capital Q. And if you end it with a question mark, then we'll know that's a question. And um, Martin Bateman will be looking in for those. And Martin's going to collect those questions together. And then we'll ask those people. So like Jay and Simon Monk and Mark Weddell, we will then ask them to answer uh, the question. So Martin Bateman has just demonstrated in the chat the best way to do that. OK, now there's another thing as well. Um, sometimes people come up with, oh, there's a really good resource. So if you can think of certain articles or things to buy, you could do the same. You could just type in the word resource in capital letters with a colon and things. That, and, and you can share URLs as well in the public chat. Now, we are recording this session. 
and afterwards when you go to view the recording everything that's been pasted into the chat will be visible to people as, as well as the at the moment we have a wallpaper that says Preston Raspberry Jam and my webcam now I'll turn my webcam off in a few minutes but I now know that I will feature my webcam in the first five minutes or so now, uh, there's a couple of other things I'm going to mention. So I've talked about the public chat. So lots of people are making use of the public chat. That's really good to see. Um, we're not expecting that we're going to have any kind of behavior on there that's not really family friendly. Because we do I, we do have some under 16s in our events this evening. Um, so, but if you're, you know, if you're thinking about making a joke that's not really safe for families or something like that, maybe keep privately perhaps. You can have private chats with people if you want. So if you want to set, like when Gary presents later on, if you want to send them a link to something, if you want to send them an email um, and you trust Gary and you're happy to do that, then by all means, we don't moderate the private chat, but we would recommend that if, some, if you don't, if you get a message from somebody and you don't know them, you don't trust them, then don't act upon it is, is the best advice we can give. Now, um, something else to mention so i've mentioned the chat i've mentioned your status and then in between the two is a notes section now maybe just now go and click on the notes section and you'll see the program i emailed earlier is there now i'll be honest it's things that seemed a week or two ago like a really good idea i'm now starting to think oh no we so we've got a lot of people who said that they want to present and talk tonight. And I know I'm going to struggle to fit all of them in, but I have asked people to give us a taste of their talk tonight for about five minutes or so. And I guess after that, we'll have like lots of people who say requests like, oh, please get, please get uh, that person back, like Jay, to talk more about robots. So if people are happy to, we can run these events more frequently than once a month. Uh, we could have one in every two weeks. We could even go more frequently than that, but obviously we don't want to be filling your daytimes with lots of really interesting, cool stuff because you've got to go and do some things like work and do things like that. So if you look at the shared notes, at the moment I've listed, I've put them, and I, I've made a spelling mistake as well. Um, at the moment, I've got nine presenters up to speak, and somebody's going to complain to me. And Alan, my name's not on there, and all I did was as people came on, I put them in in an order. So hopefully, we make everybody fit in tonight. But it might be that we're going to have to extend it and see how it goes. Okay, now, um, right, okay. So it's coming up to it's getting close to ten past. And I think if Simon Monk is ready, we can go to Simon Monk next. So um, what's going to happen next is Josh is going to use his controls to promote Simon Monk to presenter. And then I will switch off my microphone and my camera when, when that happens. Yeah. Hold on. OK, so I, d I haven't seen Simon appear yet. So I'm waiting for Simon to appear. Now, I will probably be doing things like apologising to Susan, who says, Alan, what have you done? You've not included me in the list. And the list will be a, a work in progress <laughs> as we go along. So, Susan, I won't forget you. Um, OK, so Simon is connecting his webcam. So I'm going to switch my camera off. Simon, can we hear you? Uh, I don't know. Can we hear yes. You? Yeah, so I'm going to pick up my microphone, and Jay, if you can get ready, and Mark Wedell, we're going to pass it on. So Simon, when you're getting close to the end, rather than us send a big hook, you could kind of start to know, oh, my time is running out, and then Jay can come on and whatever. All right, good luck, Simon. Uh, sounds good. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Simon Monk, and I... Um, one of the things I do is design products for a business I have called Monk Makes. And one of the things we do is make accessories for the Raspberry Pi. So um, very quickly, just wanted to show you uh, a couple that we've got. One that's a, a new one, or sort of a new one, and one that um, you just may not be aware of because uh, we haven't made much of a fuss about it. Um, the first one is, uh, I'll show you this no, little box. Some of you may even be able to scan the QR code. I don't know. So 
I'll leave it there for a second longer. If you do, it'll um, bring you up uh, a, um, a PDF document, which is basically the instructions for this book. Um, I'll also paste, in, paste into the chat in a moment the, um, the, the link for it. But this is based on a product we had before called the Electronic Starter Kit for Raspberry Pi, and it's pretty much the same hardware, except we've added in, well, we've, we've replaced the light-dependent resistor because they contain cadmium and they're sort of proud of a little, with a, a phototransistor. And um, I've got a, a list here somewhere, I'm just trying to find of the um, products that, uh, sorry, the... Um, uh, Gone. Excuse me for a moment. Yes, so it's um, got a number of the components to make a number of projects. So there's the usual blinking of LEDs. There's um, an RGB uh, LED that you can then mix to different colours using a nice graphical user interface. Um, thermometer, a thermometer with a buzzer, so that if it gets above a certain temperature, it does something. Um, there's the um, Cheer Lights project, um, much beloved by Simon Walters. I don't know if he's up on there. Anyway, there's, that's in there as well, so that when you tweet a particular colour, it um, changes the colour of the RGB LED. Um, yeah, so that's that's one product. So you get a little bag of components. You get a solderless breadboard, and you get um, two sets of jumper wires, one for connecting things together on the breadboard, and one for connecting the solderless breadboard to your Raspberry Pi. And you get a little uh, GPIO template that lets you identify the pins when you're firing up the project. So that's um, one project, one product. The other one is this um, other little kit we've got, which is the speaker for Microbit. Um, sorry, Freudian slip. Speaker for Raspberry Pi. And it's based around this little board. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that. And then um, it also includes a set of jumper wires um, to connect up the speaker to your Raspberry Pi and a little audio wire to the audio lead to connect it up and um, another GPIO template to identify the pins. Uh, so it takes, the only thing it takes from the GPIO pins is the um, power, the 5 volt power, and it's got a little amplifier chip on it and a built-in loudspeaker so that you can, if you just want a quick, easy solution for playing some audio, from your Raspberry Pi and you haven't got it connected up to HDMI or whatever, then that's um, it's quite a useful tool for that. And just, uh, yeah, both of those are for sale on CPC. Uh, and as I said, I'll put some links in in a moment. Uh, well, probably while the next speaker's talking would be the easiest thing. The other thing I'd really briefly like to mention is um, just today, I've been uh, messing around with um, the low-cost Chinese laser cutter that I've got sat in the garage. It's called a K40. I don't know if anybody's um, got one of them. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised because they're a few hundred pounds and they're, they're quite an interesting device. Um, but I've been using it to um, following the Kitronics design for laser cutting using um, half millimeter plastic, um, a um, uh, basically a, a mask. I'm still waiting on the <laughs> transparent bit. So at the moment, it's uh, well, there you go. I mean, it's useful for improving my appearance, but not much else. Um, but the idea, it is very easy to make, um, and I've put up some. Uh, I had to modify the design files um, a little bit because. With my K40, I use some software called, called K40 Whisperer, which, which is very popular. It's, a, it's an open source way of driving the, uh, the, the, the um, laser cutter. Um, and I'm about to finish, but I haven't really given you very much notice. So as I said, I'll paste the links up into the chat session. Thanks very much. That's fantastic, Simon. So um, I haven't seen yet that Jay is here. Um, there's a lot of people, oh, he, he is, so I think Josh is now going to switch things over. Simon, before you disappear, um, it's a question yeah. I was thinking of. I know I'm breaking by the rule I said about questions at the end. <laughs> waiting for Jay yeah. to appear. We had a conversation about, you've got a little, um, a, you've got a high-tech manufacturing center in Lancashire where there's pick and place machines. A pick and place machine. Yeah. And I was thinking, I wonder if there's some way in a future event whether we can, you can like strap a camera to your head or something, take us on a little tour or a bit of a walk, but it might be stretching the technology just a bit too um, much. 
Well, probably walk around with my phone would probably be the easiest yeah. way to do it. Yeah. But yes, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that would that, be quite fun. We could do that. Okay. Uh, so we're still waiting on Jay to come in and present. Now, it's possible that Jay's having some problems or, 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 or that. So I'm going to suggest that we move to the next in our schedule while we're waiting for Jay to figure out what's going on, which is Mark Weddell. And after Mark, I've managed to fit Susan Gray just after Mark. So, Simon, you can turn your camera and microphone off now. But we may ask you some questions in a few minutes when we've had our first batch of talks. So, um, Mark Weddell, we're trying to get you on to present, and then we need to have a fig. So we can see you, Mark. Can we hear you? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yep. Can we can hear you. So it's time for me to stop talking, and you can start. Okay. Well, you can see it in front of me. I'm going to talk today about. Uh, my quiz system that I built um, using uh, the microbit um, and uh, basically I have this problem I am a primary school teacher and we have a quiz every year um, in my school four houses four teams and uh, I'm stuck at the back as a teacher and they say to me who put their hand up first which house which group I'm going I don't know um, I think it was them and then they go no they didn't get the question right who's the second group and uh, and I go oh, oh I don't know so I thought I, I'll, I'll find a system and I looked online and uh, quiz systems were either huge long wires uh, or they were um, really really expensive or uh, wireless systems or they were very cheap but they didn't tell you who was first who was second they just played sounds so I thought can I build something with a micro bit and use the radio function of microbit to do that. And I came across these wonderful cool buttons. They're huge um, and they come from cool components. They cost about eight pounds. Um, and uh, inside you'll see that I've got the microbit. Uh, I can actually take this, the, the actual um, switch bit out. That's just the bit you push down. Uh, but inside here, you've got the actual micro switch there and you've got an LED on the top there. So it shows you that it's lit up when you press the button. You've got the micro bit there, which is doing the controlling. Um, because this LED is 12 volts, it requires not just your normal three volt battery pack, I don't know if you can see that, but it also, I, I, I've added a nine volt battery to it in the circuit to make it up to 12 volts. Uh, when to control those 12 volts then you need a transistor and you can just see it. i've got it on this little bit of breadboard here this little connector there you can see the transistor there um and uh, that i've put a link in the uh, the comments uh, so that they can add it to the notes uh, to my website where i've got all the the wiring diagram for this um, i've actually made it using screws to connect it to the micro bit and crimps because it then didn't involve soldering um, I didn't have to burn the fingers and stuff like that. Um, so that all goes together uh, uh, and makes your, your button and, and that's that's how you make a button. But the button's only good if um, if it, it sort of works together uh, with some other quiz buttons. So once you've made one, you've got to make another one and another one and a fourth one. I don't think you can see those all at the same time on the camera, can you? I can't move them back anymore but I'll give you a flavor of, of how it works um, if, I, if I can I'm hoping they're all switched on yeah you press the first one and it lights up you press the second one and I'm gonna press that one and it flashes so you know that one's pressed second you press the third one and it flashes oh the lights I'll turn the light off and actually see if that helps and it flashes just occasionally and if you press the fourth one nothing happens at all so the coding that's how the coding is worked so that you can tell exactly who was first second and third and you're thinking well uh, uh, by the way i've got another micro bit here um, and this one has got um, a me sound on the back of it i think it's a kicktronics one and that plays a little buzz as you as you do it as well um, you can also use the micro bit buttons the a button is the button that's actually being worked when you do this but the b button will reset it and there you go, I've reset all the buttons for the next question. 
uh, last time the blue people answered first. Let's uh, the blue team answer first. Let's try the green team on. No, let's have the red team answer you first. We haven't seen their light yet. They answer first. Their button stays on permanently. Uh, the green team answers second, and theirs flashes quite a lot. The blue team answers third, and theirs flashes just occasionally. And the yellow team, they they press, nothing happens. So you can tell exactly which order they came in. And the final bit was with this soundboard, the um, the, the way that it um, uh, I, I programmed it was, I, even though the flashes are different, depending on which button you press first, the sound coming out of the board is going to be the same for each button, the, each button each time. So the, it only sounds the first one that presses, but every time the blue uh, people answer first, it will make the blue team's sounds. So here we go. One sound for the blue team, one long low beep, and, and I even thought about the sounds. What sounds should it make? Three for the yellow team. Actually, that's that's the, I'll, I'll move that one around a bit. That's the third, if you like. Okay. Oh. Two for this one. It goes up. It goes down. The three, as I said just now, it goes up. Okay. And the fourth one is four beeps, and they all stay the same. So you can tell exactly which team went first. I, I'm coming to the end now. Um, that's all of uh, so so Josh get ready to put the next person on uh, that's a, a brief rundown of, of the project and the idea the design behind it all the details are on the website and of course I think my, I think that might even give you a link to me you've got my at web uh, at, uh, at mark from London if you want to tweet to me and ask a question I hope that's a good roundup of the whole thing back to you Alan thank you very much mark um, now Somebody made a comment earlier that was uh, they were saying that they they think five minutes is a bit silly for presentations that, that we should be well not silly that that's the word I've used that we should really be aiming for longer presentations and I think it was a good point well made um, but it does remind me back when we first started doing the jams in Preston in July two thousand and twelve we. We felt we had to start at least somewhere and then we could figure it out as we go along, which is really what tonight is a lot about, figuring it out as we go along. Now, um, I did give an opportunity for Jay to speak before I sent Jay a, a, a private message to see if Jay's, but, but I'm, I'm now going to move on to see if Susan is ready to present. Now, Susan's not had a chance to practice and and Josh. We have um we have two Susans in the list. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So um there's two Susan Grayfs in the ah, list. Susan might have logged in twice. Um yeah. so oh it looks like one of them is um reconfiguring, you know the thing at the start. Yeah, okay. Um so, oh, so oh here we go. Now there we go. Right, everybody, this is just the Dumcon user. Well, I hope you can see, and I'm going to try and bring YouTube up. No, you see, it doesn't work. So, let's go back to the computer. So, no, Susan, I'm I'm just going to mention something. So, I noticed it looks like you've got two devices, and I think one of them possibly has speakers on as well. And we're getting a little bit of echo off of that. But while while we have a look at that, did you? you I did think you sent me a link that I can share. I'm just looking back at this stuff you sent me. Um, ah, okay. So you what you could do is it, you don't have to you could switch on your camera or you do have an option to screen share and if you click on that you will find oh you, that's good because it's just one you just logged in on one machine now if you click on the screen share icon so that's in the bottom on the right hand side it's like a it's next to the one that looks like a camera i think she's gone alan Oh, 
Oh, right. Okay. That's a shame. Right. So, um, we've had two talks so far. I think what we're probably going to do is we could go to questions <laughs> and then we could have some discussions and then we can then go to Kerry, Josh. Uh, uh, David is going to come back later on. So we would have Kerry, Josh, Spencer and we'll, and then Josh again. That's what I think we'll do. So I've looked at the shared notes. In the shared notes, some people sent in some questions. And these are going to be questions for Mark and Simon Monk. So Mark and Simon, if you want, you could turn on your microphones now and we can have a bit of a discussion about it. So uh, we've got we've had three questions during that session. Um, there were two of them were from the same person. Um, so what we've had is we've had a question, which I think was for everybody, really um, same questions. While we're listening to people talking, what could we be doing? So I think there's probably a general question. <laughs> um, so while you're listening, you could be interacting with people in the chat. You could be listening to Simon's talk. Uh, you might also um, just decide to come back later on and watch the video. Um, I think one of the things we, we are looking to do in the future is to make them more kind of have some workshops so that we might invite Simon back, Simon Monk, for example, in the future and say, Simon, de demonstrate how you might do some of that. But some of the things we're going to have to allow for if we're doing workshops is we don't know what devices people have at home. And, um, and, and you know, that, that sort of thing. So um, I'm sorry, Simon, I, I might have pulled you in there on false pretenses. All right, I'm going again then. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Mark, are you going to switch on your microphone as well? Um, Mark Waddell, we had a we had a sort of question. So we had a question from Karen, which Karen's been asking, where's the box for the button? She wants you to expand on that just a little bit more. So um, I struggled over with this for some time. Um, it, it's really silly. So sometimes it, it, the, the programming it, for, bit, for me was really easy. Um, but actually finding a box that fitted it, I looked at all project boxes and things like that. It's actually an electrical junction box. Um, and I believe it comes from Farnell. But, I, cause, but I'm, you know, it's one of those things that I did this a few weeks ago. And trying to find the order that I placed now is really hard to find. I'll see if I can find it during the evening and, and tell you which company it came from. Um, but it's basically a 10, cent, uh, a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by eight centimeter box. Um, and uh, that's all it is. I had to cut a hole in it, but that's all it is. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so, so, so far, so uh, anyway, we'll move on. So, oh, and we do have another question, Mark. How do the buttons interact with each other? Okay, so um, uh, I'd have to bring up the code to show you all of, a little bit of that, but just to give the idea, um, basically uh, they radio between each other the current position. So we all start off with nobody has pressed a button yet, so that variable is at zero. The first person who presses a button claims the number one as theirs, the micro bit itself can actually show if I well I can't show you now because I'm not on the screen, but the micro bit actually shows uh, the number one on its screen um, and uh, and sends that number one to all the other micro bits. So they now know that number one has been claimed, and that then allows it to work out which light to show. Uh, the next person to uh, that that person then can't press their button again because there's another variable which we've pressed, which it works on a boolean sort of true or false, it's a one or a zero. If the button's being pressed, you can't press your button again. Uh, and that way, I just got false, uh, false repeats. And then it works through. The second person claims the number two and sends out the number two. The second, mic the third micro bit claims the number three, sends out the number three, uh, and it just keeps on going like that. Theoretically, you could have 20, 30 buttons. The problem is tool components only actually do five colors. The other one is white. Okay, now, thank you, Mark. Now, um, 
I hope that Jay can hear me. So I've had a message from Jay. Jay couldn't get something to work earlier and he's available now to give us a, a, a two minute presentation. So we're still managing to stick with our schedule and the shared notes. So I think Josh now is trying to make Jay presenter. Yeah, it's done. Yeah, it's done. So Jay, you could, if you want now, you could switch on your webcam. You can share that if you have that available, or you could use the screen share. Um, but at the moment we can't hear you. So, um, let me give that a go again. Come on, speak. Oh, can hear. Yay. We have the technology. Hi. Good evening, Jay. Good evening. I can't get the webcam. I can't get the webcam on. Okay. So, um, so sometimes people find if you sign out and sign back in but we can we can we can have a little bit of a chat so you're going to talk about you've got a is it a mambo drone what what what, yes. is, it? what is that a mambo drone a parrot mambo drone oh, oh sorry it's a parrot one okay and, and <laughs> um what does that even do so a parrot mambo drone is a drone which has a cannon and a grabber. Oh, right. Okay. So you can shoot things and then grab them afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. It can also be controlled with the tablet and the phone. And also you can code the Parrot Mambo on the computer. All oh, right. So have you, have you managed to make it do anything? Like, have you managed to get out of the box yet? No, because I got it today since it's my birthday today. Oh, oh, well, happy birthday. Um, now, I Thank remember you. after our last jab, and I remember um, your parents were saying you wouldn't be able to make it to our next jam in April because it was your birthday. So they were lying. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, well, they weren't lying, really, were they? That's, that's not a very nice thing for me to say, no, is it? I think what they meant was we wouldn't have been able to get to the jam where we normally hold it at the university, but because you're at home, it wasn't so much of a problem to, uh, to organise that tonight. So, um, right, well, um, we'll we, I think we'll, we, could do, we could do to sing a rendition of Happy Birthday to you but as i'm the only one with the microphone switched on i'm not brave enough to do that so maybe later on if we have a few people we'll record the okay happy thanks certainly um i think lots of people have just started typing happy birthday in the public chat so does that does that mean you're, you're nine years old now yes yes wow so that and you started coming to our jams when you were five years old i think yes yeah, yeah. So, wow, okay, so um, that, that's quite incredible. So, like, in another 10 years' time, you'll be 15 coming to our jams, yeah? And, and hopefully we won't be doing them online in 10 years' time. We'll, we'll yeah. be finding another way to do them. All right, well, thank you very much, Jay. Um, somebody might have just put in the public chat a link to a photograph of what the parrot mambo jam <laughs> looks like and um and lots of messages in the public chat wishing you a happy birthday so happy ninth birthday josh eh, jay sorry okay now <laughs> um right it is 25 to so we're a little bit ahead and i can see we've got kerry and josh and and they were next going to present together a joint presentation so we might have two webcams on and two microphones and you're going to talk to us about some of the things that go on behind the scenes with the micro mag but i'm not sure everybody knows what the micro mag is so here we go so i'm going to turn off my camera now to make space for you two and by the way if you're watching this at home <laughs> where else would you be watching it <laughs> If you're watching this at home, 
Um, you do have some controls on the screen. You can make the presentation bigger. You can move webcam footage around. Um, you've got some controls on that. So Kerry might switch your camera on for a moment to give us away, but grab it. For connecting yeah, mic's on, but um, my on. camera is locked. Ah, right. <laughs> I, let me try and unlock your camera. That's my fault. Um, okay. you, just, you had one job, Josh, didn't you? <sighs> there we go. That should work now. Okay, you're unlocked. Hopefully. Yeah. And there, there we go. There we go. Kerry and uh, Josh, we will have Spencer up next, and then I think we'll have Josh again, and then we'll have another break for questions. So if you have any, so uh, Kasia, if you've got any questions for Josh and Kerry, you can start posting them in the chat now. Oh. Right, okay. Um, so I'm Josh. Um, I have been doing Micromag for two years now, um, when we started. So um, we're going to do a, a quick talk today on like how we create a community magazine um, and the different steps that go on behind it. Uh, because some people see the magazine and think, oh, you just make a 40-page a PDF, how hard can it possibly be? Um, and we want to try and give people an insight of what we do uh, in our spare time. So um, I'll start off and then Kerry will go a bit more into the history of what we do. Um, but it started off two years ago today, um, and it was an idea that we had uh, just because we wanted to create a community resource for Micbit users. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people will be familiar with the Magpie magazine. Uh, we kind of stole a similar idea of that. Uh, and we wanted to create a community magazine that was uh, run by um, people who were just passionate about what we do. Um, so I think Kerry's going to tell everyone where we're up to. Yeah, so when we first started, we had no money or experience in doing that sort of stuff. So we started off um, using Google Slides to make the magazine, which was a bit of a pain in the backside to start with, uh, to get a layout and everything done and software that's meant for presentations. But somehow we managed it. <laughs> to then moving up to, what, issue five was the first one that we ever did in Adobe InDesign. Um, which now, looking at all the front covers, you can actually see it does look a lot more professional than our Google Slides ones. But yeah, um, we think we've came a long, a long way with the, our experience just from going from free software to paid software made our lives a lot easier. Um, yeah, and it was, yeah. it was all about, um, it was a, a lot of learning experiences, so uh, like you said before, we, we had no experience doing any of this sort of stuff. Like we we made the odd worksheet uh, to put on our own website or blog, uh, but not an actual project that involved putting loads of articles together, editing them. So it has been um, quite the challenge in places and we've had to learn quite a lot of things. But luckily uh, we've had a lot of support uh, from the community as well, which is one of the great things about running a community magazine. Uh, so the next bit is uh, how does the process look from having an idea to then getting it in the full magazine? So the first thing is you have an idea. That's basically what it is. So, for example, uh, if someone creates a radio quiz button machine, um, you can... Um, say, oh yeah, I want to write an article about that. So you come up with the idea and it's as simple as that. And then the next step is... So the next step, we then take that idea, uh, pick, pick a category to put it in, whether it's for a news article, a uh, make article. So the make articles are generally things that the participants, well, the readers of the magazine can go away and make. And features tend to be more of things that they want to show us rather than having code and stuff in them. And reviews, we sometimes get people writing reviews for us, but the reviews are generally done by Josh and I. 
Um, so once we then choose a category, or they can choose a category as well, they then come and put it in a form on our website and tell us about what they've come up with. So Josh has kindly created a very nice contributor's guide for them yeah. to then go through. So um, we kind of tried to streamline the process as we've gone on. So now we have it all automated um, through forms. Obviously, we still do contact people. It's not just talking to a robot all the time. Um, but we, we try to create forms that are easy to use, guides that are easy to follow so that anyone can write an article um, because we don't want that to be a barrier for people writing for the magazine. Because a lot of people that you know write for Micromag haven't had any past experience. Um, so we try and make that as easy as possible. And then basically you come up with the idea, you write it, and then you submit it via another form uh, that basically sends your PDF bio and profile picture to you. Now the next bit I don't get involved in because I don't like it, so I'll let Kerry do that one. So once we get the articles in, they're coming through a Google form which puts them into our Google Drive. I then pick them up, put them into the folder that they should be in, so whether it's a news article, they'll go in the news folder, and basically open it up in Google Docs with Grammarly on, and grammar check and spell check them all, make sure, for instance, a lot of the articles we get come in with microbit with a capital M when it should be lowercase, so just make sure all the casing and everything's correct before we put it in the magazine. Yeah, um, so the next bit is how do we put it together? So Kerry briefly mentioned how we used to do it. Yeah, so when we first started, as I said, we used Google Slides. It is mainly a presentation software, so everything is in landscape when you first start it up. So we then went into page settings, changed it all into sort of portrait mode, uh, made it the A4 size, and made a custom template basically ourselves from scratch. That took a few issues to get used to and was a pain in the backside, as I said, trying to put everything in the right text boxes and to do columns as well. They had to be separate text boxes, so it never really worked out properly. So we did have to move to something more professional, especially when we moved into print as well. So Josh then created us a rather nice template again. Yeah, so um, we bought a framework off, uh, I forget which website, uh, a website uh, deep in the internet somewhere. Um, <laughs> And we got a sponsor for Adobe InDesign for three years, um, which is something we get quite a lot, fortunately. Like our web hosting is sponsored by a company. Um, our Adobe Creative Cloud license is sponsored by someone because these are really expensive tools. Um, and it, Adobe InDesign is great, um, we found, because it's really flexible. So it has guides and everything. It's like a, pro a well, it is a proper print production piece of software. Um, because, you know, that's what we needed, but we didn't have the, I don't know, did, wasn't it when we looked earlier, like £60 a month for a Creative Cloud license for what we yeah, did? Yeah, I, I think for InDesign alone, it's about £49 a month. Yeah, so it's a lot of money, um, and we just simply didn't have that when we started off. Um, and obviously something we do now is print production, so it's really easy to do that. But there's no collaborative working mode, so all of our team is remote, and it is a bit of a learning curve to use. So, next bit is we don't just do a magazine, we do lots of other things as well. Um, so, if I do the bits that I'm mainly part of, so graphic design is something we do a lot. Uh, so, we design posters, uh, we design book covers, so that's an upcoming book that we're uh, working on at the minute. and. Uh, we do lots of graphic design um, all by ourselves. Um, we don't get external people to do that. We do get some stuff done. So like the um, robot of issue six, that front cover was done by a professional. Um, but yeah, there's lots of things that we um, do ourselves. Print production is something we've got into a lot more recently. So uh, this is issue seven, uh, that the proper ones are arriving tomorrow. So we print out um, our magazines and we sell those online. Uh, so that's quite cool. Uh, we also um, do posters and stuff like that. Lots of different things that we do. Uh, so print production is quite interesting. And we have had a lot of issues with that because 
Uh, like we said at the start, we have no experience with all of that. Uh, but hopefully issue seven should be much better because we actually found the proper export setting this time. Um, web design was a big task that we took on at the start of this year. Uh, we, redid, we redid our website um, because we had a bit of money to spend on some fancy HTML frameworks and stuff that we could use. Uh, and that looks all nice and fancy now um, because our magazine is fully online. Um, so if Kerry quickly goes through the other three, because I'm conscious that we're going to run out of time. Yep, so the business management stuff that we have to take care of is obviously all the money registering the company online. So we are now a community interest company, which means we can go and apply for funding. Um, then we did decide during this lockdown time to keep ourselves sane that we're going to podcasting. So we now do a micro bit related podcast sort of every two weeks. Uh, the first one got released last Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. And then, yeah, so then social media. So social media is a big thing for us. That's where we get all our readers and followers. We do no, ever, no other advertisement of such other than through Twitter mainly. We do a little bit of Facebook and obviously a little bit through the podcasting now. But apart from that, yeah, it's mainly Twitter is our platform by the looks of it. Yeah. So uh, if you'd like to write an article, um, if you'd like to take a quick picture of that or watch the recording back later, uh, if you go micromag.cc forward slash contribute, um, there are a few articles that we're looking for. We ran our 2020 annual reader survey that we uh, want to do every year. And these are some of the things that people wanted. So if you want to write an article about any of those things, uh, you can find the list on our Twitter as well, which is on the next page. Uh, and we'd love for you to write an article about anything, uh, but there are some ideas if you're stuck. So if you'd like to follow us, there are the links. You can follow us on Twitter, go on our website. Uh, you can subscribe to us for free or buy a print subscription um, or a print edition, which aren't on sale anymore uh, because we're not going to do any more during the lockdown. Um, you can write an article or you can download for free and the PDF will always be free because that's what we wanted to do from the start. Um, and like he said, it is not difficult to do. If you want to write an article, we try and make it as easy as possible. So that yeah, it is doesn't it. matter how old or young you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have um, anyone writing articles, um, any age. So are we going to do questions? We can fire through those quickly. So what I've, what I've done, um, yeah. you know, with apologies, I've made a couple of mistakes with the program. So I've bumped a few people around up and yeah. down. And what I'm going to suggest now is we have Spencer to present next. Yeah then Gory and yeah. Scott, if Scott's ready to present, and then we will have some questions following that. Cool. Okay, so I'm hoping that Spencer is not suffering from the issues that he had earlier today, and we can promote him now to present. Yeah. And Hello. Josh and Kerry, we'll, we'll shout you back in a few minutes when we've got some questions. Hello. I've added quite a lot of questions. Yeah, I've seen them. Talk. It might be worth doing them now. Okay, right. Yeah, so we don't get we don't a huge batch of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. So, uh, yeah. So, a few people have said earlier today, um, um, maybe just too many people to present. So, yes, I am now starting to experience the wisdom of that. But I, sometimes when we've done a lot of these online events, not everybody can plug in and switch on and all of that. So I'm going to pick out some of the questions. I'm, I'm not going to read all of the questions out, but Kerry and Josh can certainly read them. And if they have a, a little while, when they, any that they, I haven't answered. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So there was, I noticed some, like, okay, what I'm going to pick out. So, um, Right, there's quite a lot there. Right, tell us a little bit about like, so taking the magazine from start to finish, how, how, how what, what we're talking, we're talking like three or four months or so, like a period of time. Uh, so and you get a lot of submissions for the magazine. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll answer them as quickly as possible. Um, so for my perspective, we spend, uh, we typically spend a month taking in articles and then we spend 
well, issue seven was done in uh, three weeks um, of work. So it really depends. Uh, now we're using Adobe InDesign, it's a lot quicker. It used to take us about uh, a month and a half to put them together in slides. Um, but now we're doing InDesign, it's um, a lot quicker. Um, Kerry can give you a bit more of an insight on how long the editing bit takes. Yeah, the editing pretty much gets done straight away. So as soon as I see an article pop in, I'll tend to go away and edit it um, there and then. So it's ready just to put in the magazine when I come around to doing the design work. So, so yeah, so editing, it just depends on how many articles and stuff that I have at a time. Um, but yeah, that can generally be done within a week for the whole magazine. And Kerry, are you open to the idea of having other editors or sorry, or people collaborate with you or, or like, you know, Muscan asked what, like what sort of age group can get involved with the magazine? Um, any age group. So, I mean, our youngest writer at the minute, I think was actually Jay. So yeah, it doesn't matter what age you are, we will let you get involved. And yeah, if you want to come on board and help with some of the design work and stuff as well, get in touch. And what kind of circulation does the magazine reach? So um, the last issue in the first uh, two to three weeks, we got uh, 7,500 readers. Um, and the print issues are varied. Uh, it can be about 60 people around that. Um, but because of lockdowns and stuff, um, we had to cut that down. Um, well, no. Uh, it wasn't as high because people weren't sure about what was going to happen with delivery. Um, so yeah, that's the circulation. Okay. Now, um, we had a couple of questions as well, but Josh, we'll, we'll raise those later. They like ask people that like, look at the, the space that you're working in. So yeah. Robert Spencer now is getting ready to present. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Um, um, we need to get rid of those slides. Yep. Uh, and then you've got the you've got the the, the floor. <laughs> Excellent. You can unlock my webcam. That'd be awesome. And promote me to present. Well, I think you can. See, oh. Almost. Ah. Excellent. So I think you can still hear me, although you may not be able to see me at the moment. Um, just want to say, Micro Mag is really cool. Um, I've been promoting it to my students at school, trying to encourage them to download it as part of their lockdown work at home. So um, huge, big well done to the team. I think it's wonderful. Thank you for what you're doing with that. Um, I'd like to switch my webcam on. Can we, can we do that? Ah, here we go. Fantastic. Find your webcam. Start sharing. So, um, I'm Spencer and I'm from the Birmingham uh, Raspberry Jam and also co-founder of 3D Meetup UK, one of the UK's open source 3D printing um, festivals, which hopefully will go ahead this year. And I think like many people, I use Raspberry Pi to fulfill a need when I have a project or a problem I want to try and solve. And one of the problems I had was my outside security light kept coming on at night and I didn't know what it was. And I never saw what was in the garden, I never saw what kept triggering it. So I did the, the obvious, got a Raspberry Pi, put a camera on it and tried to make a time lapse camera and I never caught it. So I used Motion Eyes, tried to download a bit of motion tracking and I managed to get some blurs, some blurs of animals running across the garden. And I thought, actually that's really cool. I want to know what's really there. So I went into my first attempt at machine learning and some image recognition using um, TensorFlow and I built my image recognition camera, which you see on the front is a Raspberry Pi with an infrared camera. It's not a thermal camera, but an infrared one. And on the back, we've got a little Adafruit TFT display. One of the original ones bought at when the camp came to us jams about five years ago. And I left this in a box, left it in the garden, and every time it had some motion, it would take a photo. It would then use machine learning to try and identify what the animal was. So I want to do a live demo of this, and this is going to be quite intense. 
So I'm going to VNC onto my Mac. I'm then going to try and share the VNC on the screen. So this is going to be a big moment of truth. And if it works, please be cheer from wherever you are because this is the most daring demo I have ever done. So in a second, excellent. So you should be seeing a live preview of my infrared uh, camera. So I've got two little infrared lamps on it and these are pretty good for seeing in the dark. They're not thermal cameras because we get a bit confused. It's an infrared camera. Currently looking at my, my desk. So let's come back. I've set it up so it's all operated from one button. And that one button can trigger the camera taking a picture, editing from a program, and accessing some other menus. So just looking around my desk, I've got ah, my 3D printed homemade microphone. Take a photo. It's captured it. Analyzing, 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 analyzing. It can take anywhere between about 10 seconds and maybe 40 seconds, depending on the picture. I'm hoping to upgrade this to a Pi 4. And we've got a microphone about a fifth, fourth down the list. So it did actually correctly recognize that, which is really good. Let's try another one. Um, my, my keys. Let's see if we can do the keys. Take a photo. All triggered with the one button on the front. Oops, I managed to miss out a lot of the keys. We'll see what it comes up with. We'll see if it can find it from there. And as I said, I get these animals in the garden every night, running across the garden. Um, projector, modem, digital clock, mm, not sure about that one. And I have this camera lying in wait in the garden to see if you can see what was out there. Okay, I'm going to go under my desk. Um, I've got socks on. Let's see what can find down here. So it goes into infrared mode, looking around. Ah, I see something. Ah, who's that? All right, let's take a picture of that one. Capture it. And we'll see if we can analyse that beast in the garden. As I said, it can take anywhere between about five and ten seconds. Hello, Paul. Um, anywhere between about five and ten seconds for it to analyze, maybe up to 40 if it's really struggling. And a lampshade, jellyfish, fur coat, um, a stole, a bonnet. Hmm, maybe, maybe not that sure. So, this was my, my first foray into uh, machine learning using the ImageNet library. It was a bit of fun. Um, the success rate in daylight. Is about 75 percent the success rate in the dark is about 20 percent um it comes out with almost everything being jellyfish but it's it's kind of it's kind of fun first go at doing some machine learning let's see if we can do my my glass of um, juice there last one so it gets on oh i think it might spot the macbook in the back it might spot the keyboard it might spot the pint glass we We'll see. Um, I have got a write up of it, and I'll, I'll show a link in a little bit. This was this was a lot of fun. This was a quite a good little project, just to kind of get you started with TensorFlow, starting to get with a bit of um, image classification. Um, the image classification sort of database is from two, uh, sorry, 2012. So uh, cocktail shaker, desk monitor, it's giving a good guess. And I noticed it says mouse. I think that might be what it's thinking for the. The GitHub logo. Um, I would love to answer answer your questions. If you've got any questions about um, making a project, um, how it was started, sort of how successful it was, um, and maybe come back another time and talk a bit more about TensorFlow, image recognition, and um, uh, convo sorry neural networks. That'd be quite cool to talk about. So I'm gonna pass back to Alan. If Alan, you've got any questions or anything to come through. So um, we're gonna have. A couple more presentations and then we're going to have a group of questions together um i just we're, we're just getting ready for the next presentation which is gory and we're loading up a doc and i'm going to make myself presenter so that i can show this document so i'm just going to take over that um while i'm i'm not very good at talking and doing but i'm going to try it um so so one thing um, that I did want to say is, if I've not said enough, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along tonight. It's not the end. We've still got a, quite a few more talks to go to, but thank you very much, everybody, for coming along and supporting it. 
lots of people using the public chat. Thank you very much. That's very active. There's people using the little status icons to update whether they're happy or, or, or not or confused. And there's people who are tagging their questions or answers to questions or resources that they've seen. Now, I'm going to swap over to a screen share for a moment because our next presenter, Gory, has got a document on something called Bixby. Uh, Bixby, which you'll see as, as I get the screen share to work, you'll see that appear on your screen. So I'll just, um, you know, I think what I'll do is I'll see if I can zoom in on that a little bit, make it easier to read because the text is quite small. Um, so let's try 150%. Now, remember as well, if, you, if you're not planning to read it, don't worry. <laughs> but if you want to, uh, you can change things on your screen that will make it easier to read. Now, Gory, we need to make sure that your microphone is is enabled so that you can speak. So, um, I... All right. Okay, don't worry. We'll do that again. <laughs> One of the reasons why we're trying to keep questions in that is for, to the end is we're trying to minimize the amount of switching microphones on and off. Um, so we'll try that again. So Gory, um, I think when you entered the the session, you didn't click on the microphone button. So we're going to have to allow you to jump out and jump back in again and switch that on. Now, who did we have lined up after Gory? So Gory's going to Gory's going to come back in, and we had Scott. Now I think Scott, if you don't mind, you're watching yours from earlier i'm wondering if we should just wait for a minute because scott's got some equipment to set up in webcams and and, and these kind of things let's see how we're doing i'd like to go now, like go now if you want all oh, right okay so we um let's see, have a look i just got a message from gory let's just see uh, is she back yeah um Gory, are you back with us? Right, Scott, let's 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 give you five minutes now and then we'll pause Gory for now. So Scott, we'll make you present you now. Scott, you're one of those talks today, like many of the others, I thought, right, five minutes is just not gonna work. It should have been a twenty minutes or so. <laughs> then, yeah. I don't and you're, you're, <laughs> are you joining us from Dundee this evening? No, I say I'm, I'm up in Edinburgh. Ah, okay. I'm up in Edinburgh, but I'm hoping it moves down close to Preston, actually. Um, well, it was meant to be sometime this year, but obviously with everything that's going on in the world, those plans have been put on hold a little bit. But yes, I'm in Edinburgh at the moment. Okay. So, so Scott, you should now be able to screen share and share your camera if you choose. And all we're going to do is we're going to go to Gory after you finish so you've got at least five minutes or so now yeah right i can't actually share my webcam right let's have a look why that might be um you want to try it now <laughs> we tried this earlier today there we go I'll be sending a feedback format to people afterwards and there's lots of people on here I know will have some really valuable comments to make about how we should improve this for our next event. Right, we can see your camera. Scott, are you planning to screen share or are you just going for camera? I'll just do, I'll just do camera. Yeah, so viewers may want to hide the presentation. There's a little, up at the top right hand corner, there's like a little minus button. And if you click on that, it, it means you can see Scott. And if you click again, on the messages bit, you can hide that and you can make Scott. Oh, Scott, you look fantastic full screen. <laughs> I love that. You're, you're going to dial it and you're lying. <laughs> right, go on. Okay, so I'm Scott. Um, what I like doing, if you just look behind me there, well, this camera's in reverse, it's a bit weird, but yeah, so behind me is a modular synth that I've built myself. And um, that's what I like doing. But also, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and those kind of micro controllers are perfect companions to a modular synth or what I'm going to use. I'm going to use a mini MIDI that I've built as well. But because you can output voltages on a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or stuff like that, and what a 
uh, modular synthesizer wants to see is a control voltage. And usually what they want to see is somewhere between zero and five volts. So brilliant microcontroller territory. So this project came about from me combining my interest with synth, combining my interest with Raspberry Pi, and also you might notice this snazzy headgear that I've got on. So at work a couple of years ago, um, one of the guys at work did a lunchtime session on meditation. Now, I'd never done meditation before, but it was free and I'm an Aberdonian, so I had to go for it. <laughs> so um, I started doing it, started quite enjoying it, find it very relaxing. In fact, at the times we're going through at the moment, it's a perfect thing to be doing. So what this sensor up here does, this measures brain waves and it's called a, a NeuroSky MindWave, I think you can probably see the logo there. Um, and what it does, it can take two readings, um, it can take attention or meditation. So tonight we're going to try meditation. Now obviously, webcamming live to 100 odd people um, isn't the best situation for meditation, but we're going to see how we get on. So what we've got, if I can just do a really bad job of camera work here, so down here, there's a little Raspberry Pi down there, and that is connected up to um, the modular synth and via USB to the um, use the synthesizer down here. So this is a mini Moog that I hand built myself. Because at the time you couldn't get a mini Moog, and so I managed to build that using the circuit board I got from the internet. And then Behringer released one for like 300 quid, which was probably far cheaper than I spent on it. And um, look at the start of Behringer. So if I just turn this up, so you can hear there's a sound coming out there. Now, this is reading meditation. So in a minute, I'm going to close my eyes and try and relax and meditate. And what we should see is if the meditation, if I can get into even a slightly meditative state, um, the pitch will go up. So that's the idea of it. Now you can hear that note, it's like, it's dinging away. So this is also, this is something else that I've built with an Arduino. And there's a little sensor on the ear there. So it's my heartbeat that's controlling the speed of the notes in there. So heartbeat's controlling the speed of the notes, brain waves are controlling the pitch of the notes. So now this, this will be great for webcam. I'm going to shut my eyes and try and relax a little bit and see if I can get the pitch to go up. Okay? I'm not going to go on for too long with just my face of the camera, but hopefully you're getting an idea and you're hearing that and you're seeing what we can kind of do with this. And um, yeah, if there's any questions on that, um, happy to take questions later on about Raspberry Pis or synthesizers or meditation. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Scott, has, I think, has not only given us a great talk there, but you've solved one problem, which is we don't have a theme tune for our um, <laughs> welcome to our online jam. So I'd we'll have to see if we can record that. This, uh, it'd be probably a really bad idea to attach with it into my head. Goodness knows what kind of cacophony would come out of it. Now, I think we're going to go to Gory, who had some issues with the microphone before. But Gory, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yay. Yay. Now, um, I'm going to share that document again. And I will, what I will do is I'll paste a link in the public chat to the document, but I'll just get it on my screen first of all. So I'm making myself the presenter. And when I make myself the presenter, I can share my screen. And, and then I'm going to take the link that Gory shared, and I'm also going to post that into the public chat so that people can read it if they want as well. So when you're ready, Gori, you can you can start. So hello everyone. As you can see, you you can access the document and read it yourself if you want to. But 
tonight I can just give you a short review of what Bixby is about. So it's a bit like Google Assistant or Amazon's Alexa. It's an AI conversational engine, but it's for Samsung. It's built by Samsung. It can create events on a calendar or call someone, text someone, and so on. But you can also set up routines. For example, you may set up a routine for driving. If you turn this on, your phone will automatically set messages to be read out loud or a sleep routine that will reduce the brightness and turn to dark mode. But the more exciting thing about Bixby, more than Google Assistant, is that you can download the developer's application on your computer and actually write the code to create these setups. Uh, these setups are called Bixby capsules. So they consist of concept and action. Concepts are the information which we give Bixby, what we tell Bixby, and actions is when the information is used to do something. If you put it together and experiment with it, you can create your own setups and own routines. I found that really interesting. I've tried some myself, but I wasn't that successful. So you can have a go. In my document, at the bottom, I have pasted a link which you can click that will take you to the website where you can download the application. And it gives you some head start on how you can build it yourself. So you don't actually have to write the program. You teach Bixby how to write it for you and it writes it. So it's pretty entertaining. Um, yes, that's the link. That's the website. I think that's about it. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me and I'll hand over to Alan. Thank you. Now, Gori, that's great. You've, you've uh, in, in your own ways, you've helped us make a bit of history because <laughs> you've been coming to our jams for a few months now. And I think that's your first presentation that you've made. So I'm clapping in here and I think a few other people may be. And for those who've not met Gori, Gori is a, a student of A-level computer science at a school in Lancashire. And um, and we've had some conversations that Gori's been supporting and helping to run a computer science club in her the school that she attends, and we've had some conversations about that. So I'm I'm really pleased that you you've given your presentation tonight, and I'm hoping that we can we can hear some more from you in the future. Now, um, in terms of timing wise, we're 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 if we were sticking to our schedule, we're doing really well because the plan was that. By 20 past seven, so that would have been five minutes from now, we'd have a discussion. Uh, we did have lots of questions that were posted before. Um, and, I and I'm going to invite the presenters we just had, Spencer, Scott and Gory. If you could keep your microphones on or unmuted. We're, we're, I'm just going to go and find those questions now. And while I'm finding them, Josh, would you be able to go back to our beautiful wallpaper that we have for our Preston Jam? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, now, so if I can see now that Josh, this is this is going well. So Sp Scott, Spencer, and Gory are now here, and I'm going to pick out some of the questions that we've got. So, uh, Scott, we're going to go with a question from Muskan Sharma, who asks, Scott. This, this thing you're wearing in your head, how on earth does it convert brain waves into sound waves? <laughs> Camera well, on, if you, so, if you so, do. I have managed to do that whole talk and not mention Python. And it was very, like, half of this talk was meant to be the power of Python. Because before I learned, I, I, I actually wrote the script to do this before I even learned how to do Python. And that's one of the things that I love about Python is it's so, so simple to pick up if you you know, you can look at it on the page and kind of understand what's going on with it, even if you don't understand all the little functions and stuff like that. And since then, I've learned how to use Python. So yeah, there's a little Python script running on the Raspberry Pi. That just, it takes the readings off the sensor. Don't ask me how the sensor works. <laughs> That's well beyond me. But basically, there's a little um, USB dongle on the side of the Raspberry Pi. So it transmits over Bluetooth 
the readings from the, the Dendra thing, and that goes into the Raspberry Pi, and there's a little Python script that runs and converts that into, um, into sort of the range bit, and then it outputs as the voltage. So it's just, it's just basically a conversion thing that says, take this Dendra reading, scale it a bit, and output it as a voltage. I'm assuming though that it's a, it's a difficult project to get into because it looked like you had some very specific hardware there that that you were using, and it doesn't look like something you could just pick up from your such a local supermarket or uh, electronic shop. So, well, actually, electronic shop. So there is I put um I put a link to my GitHub in the notes, and there's a link to where you can buy the sensors. So I bought that about five years ago. Based on something I saw, there was a there was a post on Make Magazine's blog, um, which was a guy Colin Cunningham did something sort of very similar with Music Tech, but there was a link to a processing sketch on that that never worked. The download never worked, so I was like, "Oh, I've spent all this money on the sensor." And then a couple of years ago, I was thinking, "I wonder if anyone's done anything with the Raspberry Pi in that thing." So googled Raspberry Pi Mindwave, and managed to find someone had done a library for reading the thing. So. Basically, they did all the hard work, and I just did the, the little bit of output and the control voltage at the end. But yeah, so there's a there's a link to the place you can get it. It's just neurosky.com or something like that. I, I've actually linked that in chat as well. Brilliant. Um, we've we've got an offer from David Martin in chat to explain how the sensor works. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he also says he plays with neuroscientists. So yeah. yeah. Okay. One of the um, okay. Well, there are lots of people I can see here who come to these jams often, and and it is absolutely remarkable sometimes who some of the conversations that take place. Um, I might make some people blush, but I can remember somebody talk, we were at our Preston Raspberry Jam, and they they started talking about this gentleman called Simon Monk, and how how have you never heard of this gentleman called Simon Monk, and and then so he just lives around the corner, and um, so you could the the jams are great for networking. You see something, somebody else has got a, a link to a project they're working on, and there's somebody at university who knows somebody, and, and we, we have been incredibly lucky with who we get coming to our Raspberry Jam events in Preston. Now, Spencer, we've got a whole raft of questions for you that, we're, that I'm going to pick some out for now, and I think what's been really helpful is Martin has put the names of the people in the questions, but I will pick some of them out in a moment, but just before I do, Gory had sent me a message before. Gory is going to go off and have to do something shortly. So we've got a couple of questions for Gory. I'm hoping you're still with us, Gory. Yes, um, I am. Yeah. So Muskin was so impressed by your presentation that Muskin wanted to know if you actually work for Samsung. Uh, um, sorry, unfortunately, I don't. Not yet. I mean, I'm just 17. So, um, and about the programming language, Bixby supports javascript but obviously you don't need to know javascript you can you can use almost any language because when i did it i only knew python i'd never seen javascript before and i was still pretty successful in creating the capsules so i think yes you can just simply experiment with it no matter which language you know yeah okay now um thank you for answering those questions now um, Spencer, there's a, there's a teacher I've met in London as our session. Oh, you muted yourself, Alan. Okay, so that was interesting. Well, I, think, I think you muted yourself then. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, some strange, I think it was aliens were trying to communicate with me or something. I don't know, some strange audio effect happened. Okay. Um, so what, um, what's the first question? The question was, Katie, Katie's a teacher in London. She wanted to know, Spencer, what animals has your technology managed to identify it, so far? It was a really huge badger. Enormous. It was, it was huge. Yeah. And it, it came to the garden almost at the same time every night, snuffled around, had a little look, see what it could find. And, um, and I, I, I figured, like, I'd really want to find a way, so it's going like, badger alert, badger alert, badger in the garden, Spencer. Um, no, my wife wouldn't let me. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, 
and you're going to be training it to identify other things. So if you had birds that weren't, you know, frequently spotted well, in your garden. This one is based on um, an image net um, pre, um, it's a sort of library already of about a thousand different classifications. So when I restart it on a new project on Apply 4, I want to start specifically training for, um, I'm thinking I might do sort of cats and dogs or different breeds of cats and dogs. So I want to branch into like really focusing on one type of animal so it can become really proficient at identifying the breed of an animal. Okay, and we've had some technical questions on the um, hardware side from Michael Horn and from Simon Monk. So Simon was asking, do, do you need to use a Pi 4 or would you guys run on a low spec? And Michael was asking about the enclosure, like how you protect it while you keep it outside. Yeah. So the enclosure, it, most people would have imagined I'd 3D print it. Um, I would do now, but at the time it was a plastic um, flower pot upside down with a hole cut in it. And it worked perfectly well. It worked really well. Um, and I want to move to a Pi 4. I've got a Pi 4 waiting for it. But because the Pi, this um, SD card at the moment, the Pi is two years old, I can't just put it straight into the Pi 4. I need to do a new image, move the, move the software across, retrain the library, retrain the image um, information and start again. So it's a bit more of a bigger project than just popping the SD card into a Pi 4, unfortunately. And then we've got two more questions that are kind of similar in nature. So we we have a presenter coming up shortly called Gary, who is going to be showing us a robot. And he's been having some conversations at the jams about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And he, he's keen to know how you trained it. But we've also got another question from Muskin. Like, can you define what? like machine learning is it from this context and yeah you know, I, I guess when i'm teaching this at school i talk about machine learning being that kind of part of artificial intelligence where the program has the ability to learn itself learn new stuff without being explicitly taught so for example um if it's got four legs a tail and ears that could be a cat it could be a dog but the google's um search for cats and dogs has never seen every single cat in the world it might be a cat with long ears or short ears so once it's got the idea of the basics, well, quite detailed basics of what cats look like, it then can predict that there's a good confidence that this next animal is going to be another cat. I think um, AI gets a big bad press with Terminator and these kind of films, and I think people don't always realise how part of everyday life it is for everybody all the time. And what's the second part of the question? Um, it so it was about how you actually train, how have you been training oh, yeah. you? So this one was based on a pre-trained, um, pre-trained sort of system was already, already done for you. But you can, there's some great examples on TensorFlow, if you go look for it, or also I point you towards um, artificial, no, machine learning for kids. I think it was linked to in the, the notes. There's some brilliant ideas where you can even use Scratch to, um, train um, a, a machine like a chatbot so you can look at quotisms of different words and basically about giving it lots and lots of examples of things you want to recognize so with the image one if you show it 20 pictures of cats of different types of cats and say these are cats it should be able to predict this is a cat with reasonable confidence if you show it a new cat so it's about exposing it to lots of examples okay now um as we're that's fantastic. Thank you very much. That was Spencer and Scott and Gory answering them questions. Now, I'm, I've been just reviewing our schedule and we have four presenters that are left for this evening. Now, when I was planning this event, and we haven't done this before in, in this kind of in this particular way, I'd considered whether having a break would be a good idea. So I'm going to suggest that we that our presenters that we don't have the first presentation until after ten to eight. So that would be Gary at ten to eight, and then around about just before eight o'clock, it'd probably be Nadia, and then Lawrence would be around about ten past eight, and then Josh would be about twenty past eight or so. So I'm proposing that we have a twenty-minute recession or a break so i'm going to press the pause button on the recording and it can mean if i unlock microphones and people want to shout out 
there are private breakout rooms, but we haven't figured out how to use them yet. So um, where people can go off to rooms, but you may have rooms in your house available. Who, who knows? So let me see if I can just go and pause the record. So how's that? Does that look high definition to you? Great. Okay. Right. I'm going to switch off my mic now. I'm going to mute it. Right. Okay. So I guess you want to dive straight in here. Um, okay. So I thought um, this morning I'd talk to you about my latest project. Um, well, when I say latest project, actually it's been going on for about three years, uh, but it had a bit of a hiatus and I've not done much with it for a while. Um, I made a robot about um, two or three years ago. You can see um, it's standing there behind me. Um, and it was originally constructed from um, a couple of these, which are um, Meccano mechanoids. <coughs> but I found the Meccano mechanoid a bit restrictive in terms of what I wanted to be able to do with it. For one thing, I wanted to be um, taller, and I also wanted to be able to get more control over it, what it could do. So I actually took all of the original control parts out of it. So I removed the, uh, the motors from um, it was the servo motors for its shoulders and um, elbow and head and neck and so on. Uh, took out the brain, or the mecha brain as they like to call it, um, and replaced the mecha brain with a Raspberry Pi and put standard radio control servos into the joints. That gave me a lot more control over it. I wrote an app um, so that I could control it from the phone. And um, I got a, put a bit of a speech synthesizer into it um, as well, and um, basically uh, was able to get a lot more um, out of it than I was previously able to do when it was just a straightforward mechanoid. But I'd always had this idea that I wanted to turn this thing into um, an entertainment robot, so it could actually sing and dance. Problem is that, um, as with a lot of these humanoid robots, um, even some of the really sophisticated ones, um, they tend to be a bit mechanical in their movements, robotic if you like. So um, what I have decided to do now that I've finally got around to um, playing around with this thing again is to find a way of getting it to move in a more human-like manner. So um, if I just call my little presentation here, hopefully this will work or not. Um, can you see? No. Rats. Uh, right, I need to be able to have my screen share. Share your screen switched on, please, moderator. Uh, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and I don't know if there's a moderator there listening. Yeah, you should be able to do it. Are you like Chrome? Share your screen. Oh, yes, there we go. Um, right, that's looking weird. All right, Chrome tab, there we go. And that share. Okay, so um, can you see my presentation there, Josh? It should say simple motion yeah. capture. You can, okay. Yeah. So uh, the aim then was to make a, an entertainment robot move more naturally. And the way I went about doing that was to, um, first of all, try and decide what would be the best approach for doing it. I could have programmed the motion in, um, but I reckon that that would probably be quite complex involve a lot of complex maths and would be um, a long development time. Even to get to do something as simple as a circle in three dimensions uh, with its hand would be, uh, would be quite a bit of, uh, of work involved. Um, the other option was to perhaps use some kind of computer vision. And in fact, the original mechanoid um, robots had a feature built into them whereby you could use your mobile phone uh, to, um, well, mobile phone camera to actually get the robot to copy your motion. It works a bit, I suppose, like the Kinect, but in a slightly less sophisticated way. Um, but again, I reckon that would probably be quite a long uh, amount of time, and I want to get something up and running fairly quickly. So I spent a week or two experimenting with um, a wireless method um, using the BBC microbit, and I got a few microbits. Um, and using the accelerometer, I uh, was able to establish the orientation of my own um, arm. So I just stuck a few micro bits on at uh, various points. 
and then use Bluetooth to communicate with a Raspberry Pi um, and then control the robot. But the problem was that um, it turned out to be quite a slow solution. I'm sure that if I was to program the thing at machine level rather than in a high level language using MicroPython or um, the, um, the, the offering from, um, from Microsoft um, on the micro bit, then I would have probably been able to make it faster. But again, I was in a hurry and wanted it to, uh, to get the solution fairly quickly. So I decided to go for a wired approach. Um, and what that involves basically is this shoulder mounted rig that you can see behind me here. Um, and um, I'm using potentiometers as angle sensors, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute, and then um, an Arduino rather than uh, Raspberry Pi at this stage of the game uh, to actually take the signals from the potentiometers and to drive the servo motors. So I'll give you a quick demo of it so you can see what's going on. Um, so I'll just take that off for a second. Right, okay. Um, okay, so I'm just adjust this so we can see things better. Now, the, at the moment, it, there's two arms on the thing as you might expect. This is the one that I have modified, um, so uh, that's the one to keep an eye on. And if I now stand uh, in the rig, attach it to my arm. Then, oh, on. Switch the on first. Have you not got another one that you prepared earlier? Uh, well, I did prepare it earlier, but I've decided I'd better switch it off in case it went berserk. Because <laughs> during the um, development of this thing, every now and again it would go crazy and start slapping me. Um, so I thought it's probably best. Uh, if I play safe, just switch it off in between demonstrations. Right, okay, so strap yourself in. And now you can see as I move my left hand, the robot copies it. And if I move the shoulder out, the robot does the same thing. And if I lift my arm up, the robot will copy me like that. So, I can... so now I've got fairly natural movement in the robot. I can do more sophisticated. Um, motions than I might normally be able to do if I was just programming it. Um, at the moment, it just simply copies what I do. do but the next stage will be to actually get it to record that using a data logging setup. And then it will be able to autonomously play back the motions that um, I've shown it. So let's just go back to where we were at. Okay, so um, that's, no, it's not. Oh yeah, there we go. So there's my um, uh, a few pictures of the things that um, go to make this joint up. So those are the potentiometers. Basically, for anybody who doesn't know what one of those is, it's like a, a volume control, perhaps, on your um, an old fashioned uh, hi-fi. Um, I've got three of those mounted on the system, so you can see here there's two mounted to the shoulder joint. I just used some um, waste overflow pipe um, to uh, actually make the joints there. Um, and there's the arm um, in full. If I show you the next slide, um, and those are the, uh, the, the shoulder, that's the original shoulder on the mechanoid. This is the modified version of the shoulder. Um, this was all made of plastic, apart from some of the parts of the motor itself, but um, the new version has got um, aluminium cased motors with aluminium brackets holding it together. Um, these 20 kilogram centimeter servos are about four or five times more powerful than the original ones, um, because that was the other problem, was that the original robot was so weak um, that it could only just about had enough power to lift its own limbs. And this is considerably more powerful. Um, I 3D printed a, 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 an adapter so that I could actually mount the slot onto uh, Meccano um, setup, and um, the um, and then use steel connecting rods to hold the whole thing together because, uh, as I say, it is so much more powerful. 
the code uh, was um, pretty straightforward um, because I just simply adapted some code that's already available in one of the Arduino libraries. And this, oops, that particular piece of code is called knob um, because it's designed for people to use uh, if they're using a control knob. Oh, rats. Sorry about this. Um, if you're using a control knob, um, which is what the potentiometer is, then um, it will um, allow you to control that. So, seeing they're working again. Um, so, basically, it just um, reads um, the um, voltage level from the potentiometer pin, feeds it into um, an analog to digital converter in the um, Arduino, and then from that, it can establish the angle um, that the rig is um, pointing at, and then it converts that into a signal for the servo motor. Next steps on this will be to introduce some data logging. So I can actually record the um, motions that I've done. My idea will be eventually to build up a library of uh, motions so that um, if I want to teach it dance routine, for example, I can teach it particular um, sets of motions which it can then call up at will. Um, I also need to start experimenting with more degrees of freedom. So at the moment, uh, we've got the motion of the Elbow, that's one degree of freedom. Motion of the shoulder um, back and forth, that's another degree of freedom. And then from side to side, that's another degree of freedom. So that's three degrees of freedom. But a typical human arm um, will have six or seven degrees of freedom. So as, as well as being able to um, bend, um, you can also um, rotate your forearm. You can also move your wrist and so on. You can see some examples of that there on that little diagram. So I need to decide um, on how many of those I actually want to introduce because there's a trade-off between how quickly the computer can respond to all the signals from all the joints, because if I've got six or seven on one limb, then they're going to have six or seven on the other limb as well. So I could have up to 14 servos all needing um, to be controlled simultaneously. Um, and in addition to that, I also want to be able to articulate the waist, so be able to bend in the middle and um, control the head as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get a lot more fluid movement from the whole thing. So watch this space. Uh, hopefully by uh, next month I will have made some progress on this and I'll come back and do a further demonstration. Well, that, that's that been amazing. I was going to say, there was just, like, we were just absolutely silent, but then I realised I'd muted everybody's microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just as well. It stops people heckling, doesn't it? <laughs> Every every time you bring along just another little, you know, an update to this, it's just amazing the, the amount of progress. I suppose it's a it's a good advert for retirement as well. Uh, yes, or being locked down under the influence of a virus. Yeah, either of those will do. Yeah, and there's been some really really interesting uh, suggestions about sending it to go and do your shopping for you, so that you don't have to. But we're going to well, save well, them. I'm working on that, of course, because there was the other robot I brought into the jam a few months back, which was a bigger, the one with a bigger base on it that I built from a wheelchair base. Okay. Uh, that was and specifically they, designed for going outside and for possibly doing the shopping. Just, and there's been a, been a few murmurs as well that there's going to be a jam jar session after this evening's jam. So I, I know you don't always join us because you've got that long drive back to that, back, that yeah. area out in West Lancashire that you have to out travel to. Field. <laughs> yeah, you might be able to join the jam jar. Martin's going to give us some details on that later on. Okay, cool. So, abs another fantastic presentation. I'm like we've had so many great talks tonight. Um, Nadia, I've not seen Nadia's name in the list. Nadia should be up next to present. And if we can't find Nadia, then we will be going to Lawrence. Did anybody check on Lawrence whether we still trapped in that room? Oh, I actually. Hey. Okay. So Nadia's here. So, so we're gonna, we have a link that we're going to put on the screen. Martin is going to make that happen. He's just going to click his fingers and go up here. Um, now, one of the lovely things about this jam tonight is we've had a real mix of ages, and Nadia, I'm not going to. I don't know. Do you want to tell us exactly how old you are? Or... Um, I'm 11 years old. Wow. Okay. Um, and you 
have you been to a few jams before? Is uh, it like yeah. Essex, is that where? Yeah, Essex Demets. Yeah. And I think you've been to the South End Raspberry Jam as well. Yes, right? I have. Yeah. Oh, and um, so and now we've got your slides on the screen. Yes. So if you're happy now, um, you might need to say next slide, please. And then okay, that's fine. Okay. So I'm Nadi from South End Raspberry Jam, and I like coding. And when I'm older, I would like to become a computer scientist. I created, next slide please. So I created a steady hand game. It's all about how steady your hand is. If you touch the metal, it will buzz and put a sad face. In order to start the game, you need to press button A on the micro bit. You, ha you have to make your way through it without touching the metal. Finally, when you finished it, when you press button B to show how many times you have touched the metal, the LED light will turn off off and it has been touched. I coded the micro bit in my laptop to buzz, numbers and light. Next slide please. Andy asked me to speak at, about the steady hand game at South and Raspberry Jam this March and demo it to people and help new people learn code. Next slide please. I I also learned about coding, virtual reality and cybersecurity with other Essex DMETs. Next slide, please. And then this is a picture of me doing um, cybersecurity and virtual reality. Next slide, please. Next slide. That's it, that's all there is. Okay, well, that's all for now, thank you. So I know you, you were talking earlier today, we had a dress rehearsal and you said that you, yeah. you, you were hoping that you'd have been able to attend the Coolest Projects event in Manchester. Oh yeah, so I signed up for the Coolest Projects in Manchester, but sadly it's been cancelled. But, but we're still getting to find out about yeah. your cool project. Yeah, so um, the steady hand game, every time when you touch the metal it buzz and then it'll tell you how many times you touched it. I made it out of a little box of cardboard and I um, used my laptop to program the micro bit and now there's, there's a lot of cables everywhere. That's fantastic. And very, very clearly spoken as well. Thank you. Now we've Thank got you. one or two presentations left. So I would say um, Nadia and Gary, don't disappear because we've got some questions. We've got collected quite a lot of questions to direct at you in a few moments. Now, I think Lawrence is now um, trying to warm up his. Uh, yeah, can I, can I upload something? Um, you I'm not going to give a presentation, have I? Um, we, we need to just make sure you're a presenter, so Josh normally yeah. does that, and I'm just looking to see if he has many There we go. Let's see if I can upload presentation. And it's... Uh, where else we can up for a second? Now, I was just going to speak, Lawrence, while you're doing this. So, uh, yeah. there was a question earlier, and I think this question came from Mandy, Ma uh, Mandy Whittle. And Mandy was saying, can anybody do a presentation? And well, yeah, the answer is yes. So over the last couple of weeks, I've been sending messages to different places asking people to forward a proposal. And I think I possibly overdid it because we ended up with something like nine or, or more this evening and we didn't quite manage to fit everybody in. So I think we're gonna have to do some more jams online How's it looking, Lawrence, so far? I'm just in the process of waiting for okay. oh, upload button here. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, so, something I'm going to try asking our audience, and there's still a lot of people with us, so you've got a good audience there, Lawrence. I'm having to scroll all the way through all the names. <laughs> um, whether whether people are going to be happy to join an afternoon jam in the future, whether that be a better proposition. Um, or whether we should just stick with the evening slot. So on the 20th of April, we're holding a jam from 3 till 4.30. And then on Star Wars Day, of May the 4th, we'll be having an evening jam. And uh, you could just vote with your feet until there is no 
So Lawrence, you switch on your webcam. We're going to see how well that works. Now, how do I how do I bring the presentation up now that it's been uploaded? Oh, hang on, it's there. It's in the corner. Hang it's on. there. I think yeah. Yeah. Can you see that? Right. I'm going to go mute now. Can I slide this? Yes, I can. Right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, kids coding project that I released recently called Simulator Virus. It's uh, in Scratch Three, and uh, the history behind this is that uh, obviously with the, the pandemic around us, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, social distancing and how uh, delaying the spread would lower the uh, the peak. Um, and uh, there was a uh, an article in the Washington Post where they ran a lot of simulations that you could play with, and it demonstrated the effect of social distancing and how it, it uh, affected the height of the curve and the and the uh, the length of time that it ran for. Uh, Mitch Resnick. Uh, seized on that and uh, knocked up some code uh, to share up on uh, uh, Scratch Studio for people to remix. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be good if, uh, where's that next slide? Okay. Wouldn't it be good if I could actually take that code and turn it into a project that kids could follow step by step um, and actually build the simulation themselves so they understood how it worked and maybe they can modify it any way they like afterwards. So in order to do that, uh, I, I first of all had to, to, to take Mitch's code and, and refactor it slightly. Uh, um, I'll talk about how, uh, how I did that in a minute, but just to make it clearer so that we could go through this thing in a step-by-step -step fashion. Um, break it down into individual steps so the kids could jump on and off whenever, they, whenever it suits them. They don't have to do the whole thing in one. Uh, and throw some extra challenges at the end for those kids that whiz through and say what next. Um, I've provided this both in HTML form and downloadable PDF. The link uh, will be at the end. Um, Alan, you've have you got my uh, shared um, presentation slides? Alan, um, so not the slides that are you're showing at the moment. No? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll throw the, the link to that into the, the chat uh, at the end. So, you know, there are links here that you could uh, take off it if you wanted to, to look further. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide then. Um, yeah, so in terms of refactoring, um, first of all, uh, there were bits of code that uh, did certain things in this simulation, um, such as, you know, code to, to infect that person and update the, uh, the the count of infections in the population and code that would relate to that person recovering. Uh, I pulled those uh, out of his code and I, I basically encapsulated them in functions that were named infect and recover. So it's much clearer for the kids to, uh, to understand what's going on. And there was also another aspect to this uh, the particular project, the, uh, the concept of people wandering randomly. And there's a term for that as a random walk. And I do cover that briefly as a learning uh, in the lessons to rename his step to uh, random walk so it kind of fitted better uh, with what, what I was uh, explaining. Um, so the concepts that I introduced in this particular uh, lesson, obviously, you know, let's cover off what social distancing is for the kids, uh, what it actually means, um, and what kind of effect we're expecting it to have. Um, what we've got here is a simulation, so I do discuss briefly what a simulation is. I think it's good that the kids can understand that they can they can experiment with ideas in a simulation before going into the real world and it's you know it's a safer environment and you can control certain aspects that you want to experiment with that may not be easy or possible to uh, control in, in in real life and obviously you know I ask the kids questions you know, you know why why would it neither be desirable or possible to actually test these things with a real population and a virus um, so we talk about simulations. Uh, I go into random walks to explain this is how we get the population to move. And I talk about state diagrams as well. I've got a picture of that uh, later. It's a very simple thing, but you know, to get the kids understanding these concepts, because they're all, they're all embedded in this simulation. Um, and, oh, actually, I think maybe this is an old uh, presentation. And there's a, uh, yeah, so we go on to drawing a graph of the infections. Uh, as they occur and you can see it draw live on the screen and you see the peak how high it is uh, and you can play with the slider for a level of civil obedience so when 
the population is, uh, um, you know, ordered to stay at home, there may be a certain percentage that don't listen. And that's the idea, you know, what effects will it have on virus uh, spreading, depending how many people actually follow the orders. Um, and I talk about scaling because the graph needs to fit on the screen. So you need to kind of map the height of the stage to the size of your population and the width to the number of time steps. Um, so yeah, the steps that we go through in the uh, um, uh, in this project, uh, I start them off by getting getting them to build a static population with clones. Um, I then get them to build in the moving characteristics, which involves the random walk. Um, we then invoke social distancing rules. So if you're forced to stay at home, then you don't move. And uh, if you disobey, then um, you'll be moving about. And we need rules to determine when they obey and when they don't, based on the percentage of the population that, that is obedient. Um, the, we then set up the simulation parameters and initialize everything. Uh, so one of the simulation parameters is everyone starts healthy and it takes 100 days uh, for you to recover. You can obviously play with those parameters later if you want. Then we build the infection behavior. So, you know, we build the, the code for infection and build the code for recovery. Um, and we build that into the, the rules of the state machine where you've got three states, you know, healthy, sick, and recovered. And there are conditions that uh, will allow you to go from one state to the other, essentially. And I've got a diagram in the, uh, in the project that explains that very well. Um, it's a shame I don't have it because I've just brought up the wrong presentation. Um, we then get them to write the code that plots the curve, which includes the scaling for fitting the screen, um, and get to get them to run the simulation and try it for a number of uh, you know for a number of different levels of civil obedience to see what the effect is. And for those that you know are, are particularly gung ho, I list a number of challenges uh, at the end for them to try themselves to extend the code. Um, so that's the uh, that's the link to my website where I published the uh, the project. It's in HTML form and downloadable PDF if you want. And that screen there is uh, an example of uh, the the final output where the simulation's finished. And you can see the slider in the top left and the graph down the bottom. So uh, blue circles are healthy, pink is infected, and green is recovered. Um, let me see. I think. Yeah, that's pretty much me. But if you give me a moment, if this works, I will, um, I'll pop up here to the scratch uh, tab in my browser and I will actually run Mitch Nick's code once through, see if it works for you. So we've just, I think we've got possibly one or two presentations left now. And we're try I'm, I'm trying not to run till midnight if possible, but we will have an opportunity for some discussion and some questions and answers and I've shared th that link that you shared with me both myself and Josh have shared that in the public chat okay so that's where you can get the project download it off my site and uh, I, you know I put this with the with the intention of uh, giving giving the kids something interesting to keep them occupied while while home learning basically great so um the, our final two presentations or one I'm waiting on David Martin to D David came on, did a dress rehearsal early today, and, and it, it looked fantastic what David was going to be talking to us about, but he said he, he could really do with more than five minutes. So um, David has agreed to come back at a future, uh, for a future event. We're going to end up with jam packed with jams, I think, <laughs> We're trying to fit in all these great projects that we've got coming yeah, up I'm, in the future. I'm going to mute now, yeah. Yeah, and one suggestion as well is some people are asking about presenting. Um, Magpie Magazine are always asking for people to write about projects that they've been working on. It's, and it, it's really, it's such a, an amazing accomplishment when you write something that's submitted and, and then you can walk into a supermarket, maintaining a distance of two metres apart from people and then reach and take a magazine off the shelf and you know that in there is something that you've written. So. Um, that's the Magpie magazine. Now, um, Josh, I think if I'm, I've got a lot of things open on my screen, but I think Josh, you are going to be our final presentation of the evening. Yeah, I can. Uh, just let me okay. get it up. Do you want me to make you the presenter or do you think you've got that covered? Yeah, I'll sort it. Okay. Um, 
Josh has just got this fantastic knack for for making everything work and come together. I think he's been well trained by a certain Les Pounder. <laughs> the legendary Les Pounder who appeared on the Antiques Roadshow yesterday. <laughs> right, so hopefully you should be able to see uh, my screen now, I hope. So, um, hi, I'm Josh again. Um, and something else I do, apart from uh, Micromag, is I develop a program called Edubox, which is a, uh, a drag and drop version of Python. Um, for It's very similar to Scratch, but it's a Python-based system instead. And I was just going to show and share with you a few of the things that I have been doing uh, over the past few months uh, that might be useful and are coming to Edubox very soon. So the first one is um, a few UI updates. So if I, this is the current editor, by the way, here uh, on the screen. Um, that's app.edubox.org. And that is, that's been live for um, exactly a year now. Um, so if I show you the new one, so it's received a bit of an update, so you can see there's a nice loading screen there now, instead of, uh, it doesn't even show on the new one because um, it's a bit of a quick server that that one's hosted on. Um, but I've just tried to make the elements of the design a bit better. So if we go into Python 3, which is one of the more popular modes, if I just log out, you'll see that there's this new button at the top here, which says log in. Um, and the idea of this is that you can log in with your Google account or Microsoft account or email or Twitter. Um, and what that will do once it has logged in, a bit slow with being on um, the call as well. You can see that you've got my name in the top corner here. And what that will allow you to do is it allow you to save Python programs and Edubox programs to your Google account. So if I load up one that I did earlier, so this is a turtle project, you can see that this is something I did earlier today and I can add something to that. Uh, I can press save and it will save it to my Edgebox account. And then if I press run, it will run it like that. So that's another thing. Um, the last feature that I've added so far is um I'll load up a quick sample it's web usb uh, with a mic of it so the mic of it allows you to flash files uh from an online editor in google chrome directly to the mic of it instead of dragging and dropping it and if you press connect now it will automatically upload the hex file to your mic of it um, and it'll show you this cool little loading diagram there if I just cancel that. Um, the next thing is I've updated the learning portal with uh, some new resources. It's got a new design as well. Um, and there's some home learning stuff for teachers on there, um, including four home learning turtle lessons um, and these cards and all the different things that you can get there. Uh, and the last thing that Les, who isn't here anymore, I don't think, um, so I've been saving up my Patreon contributions to get a curriculum done. Um, and if I show you one of the first lessons that I've um, been working on with Les, uh, it's going to be an introduction to Python 3 of how to move from scratch to Python. Um, so basically going through from a very basic block, um, dragging and dropping, um, show you how Edgebox works and how it translates to scratch. And then um, it has a lesson plan for each one. So all the things that teachers need to give a lesson, an outline of the lesson, that sort of stuff. Um, and then the next one, just to give you a quick turtle example here, is um, some more examples of how to use turtle, how to draw shapes, some code examples. And obviously you have a lesson plan as well for that. So a few of the Patreon contribution, uh, contributors are in the chat at the minute. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you to them for allowing this to happen um, because I think this curriculum is going to be really handy for teachers 
um, because there'll be lots of content for them to go away with um, and deliver some lessons. So that will be six weeks initially of uh, content, uh, but I do look to expand that in the future as well. So that's what I've been doing. Um, so I think we're on to the questions for the previous three talks, aren't we now? Um, yeah, that's that's right. Um, trying to juggle things here, make get everybody's requests in and played. I still still amazing when I, I bump into people and I talk about edgy blocks and who created it, and people cannot believe uh, your your age. You're because you turned sixteen this year, is that right? Yeah. John, yeah. And pe people think it's incredible. They think there was some business sort of down in London or something that is created. It's not um, not a, a young developer like you up here in, in Preston. Yeah, it's I think, uh, yeah, I've been doing it four years now, so it's taken a while, but uh, happy where it's got so far. And, um, and it's, I mean, you haven't completely worked on it on your own. You've, there's been lots of people in our community in Preston, Blackpool, and, and the, the area around here that have um, mentored yeah. and guided and, and given you support with yeah. all of that. Well, the, the project like wouldn't happen if it wasn't for people at like Preston and um, around the UK and stuff who have supported me with it. Uh, it's not just a one person project at all. Now, um, a very wise man spoke to me once um, earlier today <laughs> and said, Alan, you're not going to be able to manage to fit all of these talks into a 90 minute jam. And I have to say, David Martin, you're spot on. Um, didn't stop me trying, but you, you were you were bang on with that. David was advising that in the future, it would be far better to have less talks but allow people some more time to but i i didn't i really didn't honestly expect so many people would turn up this evening as have done not just viewers but presenters as well and um i think david is 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 still around there clinging on just at the very end he, can you hear me david you can i think you can switch your microphone on if you want to speak david yeah i can hear you hey yeah so <laughs> I'm trying to reach over my hand to you. I don't think you can see. I can switch my camera on because I've got to hand it to you and say, yeah, you were spot on. Well, I've said a few things before in my time, so. Uh, yeah. So you were you were advising that we should slow down and focus on, um, not just on having quantity, but also having a, a, a good amount of quality. So yeah, there's so many cool things in there tonight, Alan. It's been really, really inspiring. Um, and it'd be great just to kind of sit back a bit, chat a bit, throw a few more ideas and bits in and and really see how that can take off because it's the chat that really, yeah, you need the, the kindling then to, to get the spark turning into a flame. So something I, I probably mentioned this already, but maybe not enough, which was, um, today, today was largely ex as an experiment as well because um, we have spent the last couple of weeks we've been using things like the Zoom platform and meetings and all you know uh, there's all these other kind of web webinar platforms and and this is one that I hadn't encountered but people were saying that they had you know they hadn't tested it and so we've built it we. At Exa Networks, where I work, we've built a, a server just for delivering these webinars. And there was like warnings about how many people could get on at a time. So I I, I really, I, I thought about half an hour in, the whole, there was going to be steam coming out of the thing and we'd be losing it. But it's, and we've been recording the whole thing. The, the recording timer has shown, it's been recording over two hours. So um, there's going to be plenty of content should people wish to go back and watch it. Have you got some? Have you got something, David? You can give it a I've, taste. I've, I've asked got you a to... couple of things actually, because um, yeah. I did offer to to say a little bit about EEG. So I could, if you let me share a screen, then I can give you, um, I can give you a, a very quick overview of EEG, and then I'll give you a taster of what I'll talk about. A little bit more um, in uh, at the next one.
because it's still a work in progress. It's been kind of inspired by um, what's been going on. Okay, so let me hit the magic button. Oh, hang on. Wrong magic button. <laughs> it's always the fun when you've got um, you've got a couple of screen couple of screens going, and it always goes on to the wrong one. Right. Thank you. Ben. Okay, so I'm going to share this one with you. Um, do let me know when you can see it. Okay, I can probably see it come back up there anyway in just a moment. So we can see an image being shared now. Yeah, okay, so I was going to say something about EEG or brain waves, and you've probably seen pictures like this. So whilst people were, were, were chatting, I, was, I, I threw a few bits together because I, I work with some – I'm at the University of Dundee. I, I, I deal with biological data. It's my, my day job. And uh, I work with uh, some really great neuroscientists, so we, we play with EEG data. Um, so this is the kind of thing you're used, used to seeing pictures of. And how does that go into being able to control something? Um, so here we've got loads and loads of electrodes on someone's brain. We've got, each electrode is giving you a different channel. I'm going to flick over to what the mind wave thing is doing. Okay, so if I can... Yep, okay, so we've got a diagram here. And... As your brain works, as your neurons fire, they're, they're giving off little sort of electrochemical signals. And they're doing that sufficiently that we can detect it. It's really, really weak. It's, it's like a few millivolts. But we can detect that by putting a probe typically on the front of your forehead, just as you saw um, Scott had on that device. Another one on the back. And you could use other locations as well, but these two are really good for picking up basic brain waves. And then you need a, a third point, which is not related to the brain at all. So it's not going to change. This is your reference. And typically, your yeah, the mind wave thing just clicks that on your earlobe, but you can put it on your elbow, on your knee, anywhere else on the body. Um, and the electronics then in the hardware, they're measuring the difference between those two points. Now, that could be positive. It could be negative. But it's measuring that very, very small difference and then amplifying that up to give you um, a signal that looks a bit, you know, just like a sound wave, you know, just jumping up and down as your brain's doing all its different things. And that's loads and loads of different signals all overlaid on top of each other. You're thinking about loads of different things at once, and you've got kind of the background processes of your body going on as well. So what we do is we feed that into some hardware that does a mathematical transformation and turns it from amplitude, the size of those um, peaks over time, to the frequency and how strong each particular frequency is there because any signal you can make up with a whole load of different frequencies of you know different combinations of them put together and this does maths called the fast Fourier transform and from that we can then identify the different types of brain wave um, so this all happens in hardware in the mind waves thing I was I've been looking at building one of these things for a while and now this thing's available you can pick up the the basic module for thirty dollars or so on uh, AliExpress. Get it shipped from China. They do all this in hardware. Take those signals and then we'll convert that to a nice serial output. That's that's really easy. As Scott will um, valor, it's really easy then to read from a Raspberry Pi just reading a serial signal in. So what does it actually look like? Now this actually the the the, the top line. I was scrabbling around to find some sound waves. These are actually uh, bats, but don't worry about that. It, pretend it's brain waves. You know, this is the kind of sound waves or brain waves you'll get in a signal that's just up and down. And we run that fast Fourier transform, and it gives us a spectrogram. So see up the side, we've got different frequencies. I don't know if you can see the cursor move there, um, but those are going from zero to fifty hertz. So fifty times a second, things are changing there, and the amplitude. Uh, goes from dark blue, which is very low, up through to really light blue there. And your your sort of theta and alpha waves are really, really quite um, quite strong compared to the, the beta, gamma, and delta. So there's a little bit of trying to pull things out. And there's a zoomed-in picture up to the side um, there. Now, I have to look on one thing. This is not human data. This is mouse data. My, my colleague actually measures brain waves in mice as they're given various sort of experimental drugs or given different tasks and things. Um, 
but these are the kind of things in human where those frequencies correlate to so these alpha beta gamma delta and theta waves all correspond to different kinds of behavior so these are put together by the mind waves thing into a score for yeah, attentiveness and a score for meditation and you can just read those directly from the hardware really easily so it's actually a cool piece of kit and after seeing scott's sort of preview um at lunchtime i got on to my colleague and said have you got anything in your your, your sort of public engagement budget because can you can you buy me one of these things so hopefully in the next week or so i'm going to have a mind wave to plug in to and this is where i go on to the the next um the teaser so i'm just going to stop sharing the screen briefly there whilst i switch over to something else and i will show you if i can persuade the buttons to work correctly a very very quick teaser um for this right let's go back to sharing and we will share this so i'm in dundee dundee makerspace which has the same initials as me which is great there's my twitter handle if you've got if you want to follow me for all sorts of nonsense and other things anyway um i'm of a certain era and when i grew up um one of the toys when i was sort of sub teen um that you could play with was this thing an etch a sketch which was fantastic because you could just twiddle the knobs and draw pictures um but one of the things that was also around in the, the 1980s were, were were these things here these pen plotters and um put that together with one of these little my raspberry pi model b and you can turn that into a nice technical etch -a sketch um and what would be really really cool with that now is using the eeg things now that i've seen how scott does it and hopefully i'll have a toy with is actually being able to draw pictures with your brain and i'll show you all about how to do that at the next talk so is that enough of a teaser That's, that's brilliant, David. Um, we, I think we've, we've probably got enough people from Dundee that we could we could run a jam, especially just to listen to all the fantastic stuff that's going on in Dundee and at the Makerspace. Um, right. I, I'm wondering, and it'd be good, I'm going to look at the chat now for a moment. I'm wondering if we've got time to deal with questions from all of those talks here or whether I should suggest that we go back and spend some time with the other people that we're in lockdown with. Um, somebody somebody, give me some, tell me what you think is the right thing to do, speak up. Should we go through some questions on those presentations? Cause, and we had, I can remind you what they were. So we had presentations. Um, we just heard from David Martin, and before that we had Josh, we had Lawrence, we had Nadia, and we had Gary. Um, but we started this thing at six o'clock and we're approaching nine o'clock, which is around at the time a jam normally lasts. So, um, people have responded in the chat, but not to the question. Okay. So what do we do? Do we go, do we? Well, I just quickly re respond to some of the questions that yeah. Lawrence had asked, um, so I'm scrolling back up and it keeps scrolling away from me. <laughs> uh, Lawrence asked about the different signals. Well, actually, the, the signals alpha, beta, gamma, and so on are really just defined by um, researchers who looked at um, spectrograms like the one I showed you and just said, oh, look, there looks like there's a signal there and it correlates with something. So those boundaries are kind of uh, arbitrary. So actually, in the lab, we're not really interested so much as to whether it's theta or beta or something we're looking at signals in the beta range or in the beta range and how those respond and how those change with different behaviors yeah sounds like somebody's got a microwave on <laughs> next to their microphone um, so so if your question was when you look at that that composite picture i showed right at the start with some with lots of electrodes on um those are not each a different frequency. Each of those is all of the frequencies together. 
but at a different position. So you can kind of map different zones of the brain as to doing this, and other zones of the brain are doing that at other frequencies. Okay. Does that does that answer that one for Lawrence? I hope it does. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Brilliant. Okay, I know almost nothing about REM, so I'm not going to even try and answer Surly's question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's also I'm I'm waiting to take the cue from Martin Bateman, who's going to jump on in a moment. He's going to mention something that's happening afterwards as well. He just I think it's just oh. Muskin, that was audacity, yes. Okay. So uh, Martin... For the, uh, yeah, so, I... so when I showed the pictures, the uh, sound wave was out of audacity, but the spectrograms were drawn using R. They, actually, mm -hmm. they were analysis of real EEG data. Uh, and, and I can answer Muskin's other question to me, that yes, I did make that website myself with uh, blood, sweat and tears. So Martin has posted something in the chat. So often after our, in fact, regularly after our Preston Jam, we go to another building around the corner that stays open later into the night and we go and get big glasses of lemonade. And sometimes we, sometimes we don't drink lemonade. We drink Coke and we eat crisps there. And Martin has christened this event as the Jam Jar. Because it's, I think it might be Cockney rhyming slang or, or jar refers to, oh, it's, jar would be like the big glass receptacle that we that we drink the lemonade out of so um if you fancy a jar with martin i think martin's going to be sidling over there now and opening the shutters of the jam jar and um, you can go and join him if you want for some banter um there uh, there were a couple of questions that i thought it's a real shame not to ask them that we we had some questions for nadia um, where people were asking if that is still there, like, yes, how on earth you went about programming it, you know, how did you figure out how to do this, how to, how to program so, it? Um, when I first started, Andy told me everything what I had to do, and then I just started watching vi videos in YouTube to explain how to do it properly, and then I I just learned and practiced every single day, and then I just managed to do it. And have you, has, has there been like a, a mentor, like you mentioned Andy, would you say he's been looking at what you've been doing and pointing you in the right direction and giving you some tips? Yeah. He okay. had. Yeah. Uh, sticking with programming, Gary, I don't know if Gary has gone off to the jam jar. Or yeah, really I'm still here, yeah. yeah. So you might have seen Gary, you may have even answered, there was quite a few questions for you about how you actually program your device and, and the particular programming language, how you yeah. combine it all together. Yeah. Um, well, initially, when I first um, set the robots up, I was using the Raspberry Pi. And most of the programming um, for that I did using Python. Um, but when I came to this latest project, I found that Python um, is actually quite a slow programming language, especially when it comes to doing things like, like um, um, stuff that's happening in real time. So as I move my arm around, there's a lot of data flying about. And um, the um, Raspberry Pi isn't necessarily that quick at um, dealing with that. Um, if it's operating through a program written in Python. So in the end, I gave up on that and decided to use the Arduino instead, because the language that that uses, um, which the Arduino people called processing, that's the name they give the language, and it's based on C and C++, I think. Um, that's a lot quicker because it's a lot closer to running at the top speed of the computer um, than Python is. So um, I used that language for that. But they're both, if, if you know anything about programming at all, you'll find um, Python a very easy language to use. And, and the language that they use on the Arduino is pretty straightforward as well. Uh, and there are lots of examples out there anyway um, of code. And my programs, well, the, the latest ones for this um, particular project, um, using the ARM, um, were based on existing code anyway. So all I had to do was modify it so it didn't very long to, to, to work on. <laughs> One of the things that, you know, quite serendipitous 
that I've enjoyed in my head. I've been trying to imagine what would happen if we could combine Scott Young's brain wave reading technology with your arm and to attach it to somebody's body to try to do Nadia's um, steady <laughs> hand thing, you know. Yeah, it, it, that's perfectly that conceivable, cool. actually. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we have the technology, it could be done. Um, yeah, I find so, that the, the mind control thing's a bit twitchy, though, so you really want to stand quite close to that robot when it was doing it. But yeah, it's a great <laughs> idea. But Gary did say there's lots of data flying out, so I imagine there'd be a few other things flying about as well. <laughs> yeah, um, nice idea. Yeah, there's another sensor you can add to that, which is. Uh, um, EMG or the, uh, the electrical signals you get from your muscles and uh, if you google myoware m-y-o-w-a-r-e then you can see one of those and they, they look pretty cool and that's something else I'm wanting to, to wire up and uh, pull data out of uh, I've got one in a box just next to me but maybe I'll save that for next time as well yeah, yeah I've seen that stuff as well David and I've been wanting to get involved with that for a while now so yeah, very good. It looks, it looks, it looks like a lot of fun as well. I was hoping somebody was going to ask a question that mentioned the word electroencephalogram in it, but I, I've not, I don't think I've seen any questions yet because I was looking forward to practicing saying that word, electroencephalogram. But I um, think you've mastered it, Alan. Very oh, good. Oh. Right. Um, I posted a link a few minutes ago asking people, could you give some feedback? And people always go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. If if you could please do it while it's fresh in your mind, it will probably own, it'll take you less than a minute to do it now. Um, and we're hoping to have more jams, perhaps with less presentations, less hours. And if you've got any, please put it in the feedback form. Like, do you think it should be done? They should always take place on every Monday, every week, and then we can certainly see about how we can make them happen. Right. Thank you so much. In um, probably in a couple of hours, come back in the morning, you should find all of the recording available on the link where you came to sign in. I'm going to try and wrap things up quite quickly now. If you want to carry on chatting and banter, you need to go and find the link that Martin Bateman posted to the Jam Jar. And um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, but just make sure to fill in the feedback form before you go to the jam jar because sometimes people drink lots of glasses of lemonade and then they struggle to be able to fill in the feedback forms honestly. Oh, um, there's a couple of links there you need to grab. But you can nosy on over to the jam jar and you might need to bring some age verification with you as well right i think i could possibly copy them and send them no 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 i think if you want to go badly enough